Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you will find this session interesting and informative. My name is Nofal and I've been working at PCAN as a machine learning engineer for the last three years. I am part of an amazing team that is responsible of building scalable data pipelines and productionizing machine learning. I joined PCAN after my military service. I was serving in a Unit A200 for seven years. And the most important thing in this slide is Cocos. He is my super cute pandemic puppy. And as you can see, he likes to come to the office with me. And he also likes to work on my friend's keyboards. In this session, I'm going to talk about some tips I gathered in our journey of uh, building a generic and scalable pipeline. I've tried to pick the most important ones, especially for those of you who are thinking of building such a pipeline or in the early stages of the process. Uh, I'm going to focus on some topics that uh, are common and fundamental and that in my opinion, it's worth uh, spending time and effort into from the beginning of the process. For the context of this session, I want to start by telling you a little bit about uh, PCAN. PCAN was designed to drive business value from machine learning and also make it possible for people who are not data scientists to use predictive analytics. Uh, as you all know, uh, data science projects can be very slow, and we try to break this trend by automating the data preparation and basically the entire training process. And deploying new models to production can take us days or even hours, uh, depending on the amount of data that we need to process. So the first step in the process is to plug in data sources to the platform. We all usually want to build models that use data from different sources. Uh, PIC can allow you to do this by creating connectors to your different data sources and using all of them to train your models. After connecting the data, you can start modeling your business question by using a wide range of templates that uh, are offered in our marketplace. You can find there, for example, templates for churn problems, for lifetime value problems, for conversion, and many, many more. After choosing a business question or a template, uh, the platform will walk you through the modeling stage, helping you understand what are the entities you want to train on, defining the label, and in choosing the set of attributes that you want to include in your model, you just need to drag and drop uh, the, relevant, the relevant tables that you want to use. And it's important to understand that we don't require any data preparation. Our pipeline knows how to handle data and actually restructure the data to be machine learning ready. So let's dive into the first tip, start with a plan. Maybe it sounds like it's obvious, but it's a super critical stage. I guess we all agree that building a generic machine learning pipeline is a pretty complex task, and we need to fully understand our requirements in order to build, to build it appropriately. We always need to remember that we can solve all the problems in the world, so it's better to define well the domain we are working on and stay focused. This is a high level version of our pipeline. When we started thinking about the structure that was right for us, uh, we came to the conclusion that our pipeline should consist of three parts. The first part is the training pipeline. In general, the output of this pipeline is a deployed model in production. Um, the training pipeline starts by collecting the raw data from the customer. After that, we structure the data and clean it, and then splitting the data to train test and validation datasets. Then we perform encodings, imputations, and smart feature engineering process. 
And of course, select the wanted features right before we train a, a set of uh, different models with uh, different hyperparameters. Um, and then we actually have a, a set of trained models that we can uh, evaluate and choose the best model and deploy to production. So at this point, the user can start using the model on a daily basis um, and actually schedule uh, his or her predictions um, for whenever he wants. The second part is the inference pipeline. After, uh, after our model is ready, we actually can start using it whenever we want. These pipeline outputs are ongoing predictions. And as you can see, some of the stages of the stages are mutual between the training and the inference pipeline, but not all of them. Uh, so you can see the dependencies. The third part is the evaluation pipeline. We want to monitor our models and see that they work as expected. I didn't mention the details of the evaluation pipeline on this flow, but it's a, another part that should be scheduled. Um, there are many future decisions that we will have to make based on the structure of our pipeline, such as how to properly design the system and what tools and frameworks we should use. Um, so I really believe that this is a very basic and uh, important stage. The second tip I'm going to talk about is choosing a powerful orchestration tool. Orchestration tools are used to manage, schedule, and also monitor workflows and pipeline infrastructures. Uh, as we saw in the previous slide, pipelines usually consist of many stages with dependencies between them. So orchestration tools help us define and manage these dependencies and make the process much easier. It allows us to focus on what's necessary rather than spending time trying to automate the process from scratch. So how should we choose the best tool for us? Uh, there are so many of them. And the answer is like always, it depends. Uh, it depends on your needs. And at PCAN, we chose Apache Airflow as our orchestration tool. Each one of the rows here represents a DAG, which is actually a set of stages with dependencies between them. Under a runs column, you can see uh, the status of how many tasks, which means stages in the DAG, are currently running, how many already finished successfully, uh, how many failed, etc. Under the schedule column, you can see what is the schedule configured uh, for a specific DAG. And it's flexible. You can choose if you want to execute a DAG only once or maybe on a daily basis, weekly, uh, etc. And now let's talk about how a DAG looks like. Um, in the picture at the top, you can see how a DAG file is built. It is actually a Python code that defines each of its tasks and the connection between them by the double angle brackets. Um, the dummy operator refers to the type of the task. Airflow implements different built-in operators, and I will talk about it uh, later. In the picture at the bottom, you can see how the flow that was created for the code above looks like. So again, the dependencies between the tasks are represented by the uh, double angle brackets, and the tasks themselves are, um, the, in this case, the dummy operator tasks. Before I dive into the reasons we chose to use Airflow, <clears throat> I'd love to spend a couple of minutes understanding its architecture. Um, one of the reasons we chose it, by the way, is its uh, modular and scalable architecture. So 
let's uh, start with the web server. This is the user interface of Airflow um, that can be used to get an overview of all the overall health of the different DAGs and also help in visualizing different components and states of each DAG. Uh, this is actually the dashboard that we saw earlier. Um, next is the scheduler. This is the most important part of Airflow. Um, the scheduler is responsible of uh, orchestrates different DAGs and their tasks and taking care of their interdependencies, uh, limiting the number of runs uh, of each DAG so that uh, one DAG doesn't overwhelm the entire system and makes it easy for user to schedule and run DAGs on uh, Airflow. Um, the executor is responsible for executing the task themselves. Um, there are different types of executors, um, for example, Celery executor and uh, Kubernetes executor. And people usually select the executor that uh, suits to their needs. Um, we chose to use Kubernetes executor um, it provides a way to run Airflow tasks on Kubernetes, and it means that Kubernetes launch a new pod for each task. Um, next is the metadata database. Um, Airflow supports a variety of databases for its metadata store. And this database stores metadata about uh, DAGs, about their runs, and about other Airflow configurations like users and roles. And the web server shows the DAG states and the, its runs from the database. And the scheduler also updates uh, this information in this metadata database. And now we get to the point uh, that I'll explain why we chose uh, Airflow. Uh, I think it's more interesting to talk about the considerations for choosing a tool than about the tools themselves. And I also assume that while I'm talking, at least one more new tool is uh, coming out. And so let's talk about why we chose Airflow. Um, the first reason is that Airflow has a big community and is also scalable. We already saw how uh, its architecture supports it. Um, another reason is uh, the fact that Airflow comes with uh, a lot of built-in operators, for example, Kubernetes operator, HTTP operator, JDBC, uh, and it was super important for us because we have different kinds of workloads that we run. Um, for some of our pipeline stages, we need to execute dedicated containers. Um, for other stages, we need to execute jobs on some cloud services. Uh, and this variety is uh, super important for us. Next is um, that it's easy to create new customized uh, operators. We've created some customized operators because we wanted to control and change their default behavior. Um, for example, for executing tasks on Databricks platform, uh, we've built uh, our own connector, uh, sorry, operator. Um, we also wanted to be able to control resources for each uh, of our customers, and Airflow allows us to do it by uh, using its pools feature. Um, another reason is that our pipeline is mostly written in Python, and with Airflow, we can use pure Python to build workflows. Uh, it's also very easy to test uh, the flow structure with the standard frameworks like PyTest. Um, another reason is that Airflow is powerful in terms of uh, dependencies uh, management. 
We use it to manage the dependencies between the different stages in the pipeline. And we also implemented some nice tricks of uh, building our flow and dependencies dynamically uh, in respect to things that we find out only in the middle of the flow. Um, and then we actually change the, the flow structure dynamically. And the last one is that Airflow is monitoring the status of uh, each stage and uh, allow us to choose uh, what we want to do in case of a failure. So these are only part of the reason that we chose Airflow, but I think we cover the important ones. Um, so before we are moving to the next step, uh, I want to talk about a, a nice mechanism uh, that we've built using Airflow. But first, let's talk about a, a concept I guess most of us have come across in the past. Uh, the concept is that inference pipeline should run in the same version which the model uh, was trained on. And when I say version, I mean changes that break the usage in the model. Uh, for example, data structure changes. Um, so let's take a look at an uh, example. Um, let's say we have Sophie. Uh, she is a data analyst who built her model when Picken platform was in version uh, one. Uh, Sophie also decided to use her model on a daily basis to get uh, predictions for, let's say, her churn model. Um, after a while, Pick and Team released version 2 and added some new interesting uh, features to the feature engineering process. So we don't want Sophie's inference pipeline to be influenced by the new feature engineering uh, that uh, Pican released. We want it to run and create the same features like in version one. Otherwise, we will have compatibility issues between the trained model and the input data. We want only new models of Sophie, or of course other people, um, that were trained on version two to be affected by the new feature engineering process. We solve these uh, compatibility issues by signing each model by its uh, training version. It means that if a model was trained with version X, the inference process will run exactly the same, even though there are new version released. Um, we technically save the version of the model and then load it to the DAG. Um, then Airflow knows uh, to execute the inference tasks in the original version they were created on. And it means that Airflow knows what is the right version for the model and pulls the right code, which can be Docker images or Python packages, for example, uh, in order to, to be able to run it in the exact same version. So enough with Airflow, let's move to the next step choose the correct data processing technology. Um, in the data science process, we put a lot of time and effort into preparing the data to be machine learning ready. As you can see, uh, like with orchestration tools, we have a lot of possibilities and technologies uh, we can work with. We chose to work with uh, Spark which is an open source distributed processing system used for big data workloads. It utilized in-memory caching and optimized query execution for fast queries against data of any size. Spark is designed to cover a wide range of workloads such as batch applications, iterative, uh, iterative algorithms, interactive queries and streaming. And we use Spark on top of uh, Databricks, which is a, a platform that manages Spark clusters for us. Um, and of course it does uh, a lot of other useful things. 
So let's talk about the reasons we chose this combination of uh, Spark and Databricks. The first and obvious reason is that we need to be able to process a lot of data. We process billions of records using Spark and it would not have been possible if we hadn't used such a, a distributed technology. Um, the second point is uh, that since our users model their business question using uh, our templates, which are actually GUI interfaces that uh, convert their questions into SQL query dynamically, uh, it was mandatory for us to be able to query their data using SQL, um, which is, of course, possible uh, with Spark. Um, Spark supports streaming, which is useful for different use cases. Um, and Spark cluster can also auto scale according to uh, the status of the workload they run. Um, another reason is that it's possible to execute different Spark jobs in parallel uh, on different clusters so that there will be no conflict between them and competition for resources. Um, and the last reason is that uh, Databricks offers different types of runtimes. Uh, each one of them includes different packages and configurations that are already installed. And it can uh, also be very helpful when trying to maintain the same infrastructure with, between training and prediction uh, pipelines uh, in terms of versioning, like uh, we talked before. So in general, you can use Spark with Python, Java, Scala, uh, or R. And uh, it offers many more advanced and relevant capabilities that I didn't mention here. Um, such as distributed training uh, of models and uh, di distributed implementations of uh, different uh, encodings, etc. Um, it has a very powerful machine learning module uh, that I recommend you to take a look into. Now let's describe Spark uh, architecture. The Spark framework uses a master-slave architecture that consists of a driver which runs as a master node and many executors that run across as uh, worker nodes in the cluster. Uh, the driver program in the Spark architecture calls the main program of an uh, application and creates a Spark session which consists of all the basic functionalities. Uh, the driver is, is responsible for translating the user's code into jobs that are actually executed on the cluster. Um, Spark driver works with the cluster manager to manage uh, different uh, jobs. And uh, the cluster manager does the resource allocating work. Uh, then the job is split into multiple smaller tasks, which are distributed to the worker nodes. So worker nodes uh, execute the tasks uh, assigned by the cluster manager and return it back to the Spark context. I mean, return, return back the results to the Spark context. And executor is uh, responsible for the execution of these tasks. And if we want to increase the performance of the system, we can increase the number of workers we have uh, in the cluster so that jobs can be divided into more logical uh, portions. So it takes some time to understand how Spark works and optimize our jobs to run in the best way. And I would love to share with you some optimizations we faced in the beginning of our journey with the Spark. So one of the things we encountered early on when uh, entering Spark is that when we execute queries on the data, it's uh, very important to understand how the execution plan of the query looks like and how it is performed behind the scenes. Um, 
When it comes to uh, a lot of data, queries do not always run best without uh, our help and optimizations. Uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, it's not a magic. And for example, if we want to join a, a big table with a small table, uh, there are two ways uh, this can be done. In the first example, we have a customer table which represents a, a small table and transaction table, which is a big table and we want to uh, join them by CID. So first way is that both of these tables uh, are going to be spread between the cluster workers and in order to join them, uh, the, the data should be shuffled between the different workers so that we can compare each record in the customer table with each record in the transaction table. We should try to avoid shuffling as much as we can since it slows the process and sometimes, sometimes even makes it fail. Um, an alternative to this is to broadcast, which means in simple words to send, a, a copy of the small table uh, to each one of the workers. And if we do this, uh, the join operation can be performed inside each worker and it saves us shuffling, which is super expensive. So Spark sometimes executes these optimizations by itself, but it's not always happening. Uh, we can help Spark by adding hints, for example, to the queries and let it know that we think that broadcast is the right strategy to perform this operation. We also need to make sure that the default Spark configuration doesn't block us from performing the wanted execution plan, since there is a parameters that uh, defines the maximum size, for example, for a, a table uh, for broadcast. And of course we can change it, but uh, we need to be careful and not to choose the uh, high numbers. Some more technical tips are, um, we already talked about the first one, in case of uh, inner join between a big table and a small table, um, use broadcast join and avoid shuffling. In case of right join and left join, so be aware that broadcasting the right or left table is not supported. Uh, full outer join doesn't support broadcast at all. And basically the best thing is to always look at the, at the execution plan, not only for queries, uh, also for your Spark job, and make sure what's going on behind the scenes and how you can improve it. Another tip is to use file formats that are optimized to Spark. For example, we prefer to use Parquet, which is a compressed and efficient columnar data format over CSV. And of course, there are so much more uh, tips and so much more to talk uh, about Spark and especially about optimizations in Spark. But since we have only one hour, so uh, let's try to cover some more uh, tips. So our fourth uh, tip is to think abstract. Um, abstraction as a concept in software engineering is good, um, but sometimes when it comes to data science and especially to building generic pipelines, it becomes a little bit more complicated to implement uh, data and machine learning pipelines are characterized by many parallel executions of similar but different logics. For example, collecting data from different sources, training different models with the different interfaces in parallel, and then choosing the best one, evaluating a set of models with different uh, evaluation metrics, uh, etc. And Abstraction is a key factor when it comes to building generalized pipelines, since we want to support a variety of use cases. Uh, it requires us to support different implementations and frameworks. 
and it can turn out to be super complex to maintain the pipeline if we don't keep the abstraction principle. And let's look uh, at a couple of uh, practical examples that uh, uh, we faced. So the first one is uh, reuse code as much as you can. Uh, use the same data processing tools uh, you built both for training pipeline and inference pipeline. Otherwise, you end up with maintaining uh, duplicate code parts and having a lot of compatibility issues between the train pipeline and the inference pipeline. Uh, it practically means uh, you need to put some time in designing a modular pipeline so you can build it like playing with Legos. Another example is our template marketplace. As an AutoML platform, we support a lot of uh, predictive analytics use cases. And instead of creating a dedicated pipeline for each one of the supported use cases, we've came up with a generic approach for the business question modeling. We've decided to define a couple of entities that are generic for each model. The first entity um, represents the entities that we are going to train on uh, or predict on. The second uh, entity represents the label for each one of the entities. And the third entity represents the attributes, which are the features that we use uh, in the training pipeline and in the inference pipeline. Each one of the use cases is translated to this structure, and then we can proceed with one generic data processing and machine learning pipeline. Another tip is to keep a, a single interface between different frameworks. Um, when building generic pipelines, we usually want to handle different types of problems, which sometimes require different types of solutions. For example, uh, in our training pipeline, we train many types of algorithms with uh, different parameters and different interfaces. And then we evaluate them on the test data set and choose the best model that we later deploy to production. We want to train all the models in the same way and also evaluate and use them for predictions in the same way. Uh, we don't want to duplicate code and create a system that is hard to maintain. Uh, we definitely prefer to define a clear interface and build our training component in a generic way that doesn't require us to duplicate code at all. The next one is, is my favorite. Uh, try to find creative solutions for complex problems that require implementing uh, the same mechanisms in multiple ways. Um, a nice example I have uh, from uh, my day to day is a super cool project I worked on with some of our amazing engineers. And as you already know, uh, PCAN is a SaaS platform. And recently we had more and more customers that can share their data with us uh, because of regulations. Um, when we started to think about an on-prem solution, uh, we came to the conclusion very quickly that uh, this is not something we would want to get into uh, because of the maintenance of such a solution. Um, and we knew it's going to take a lot of time and effort. Um, instead, we came up with a solution that keeps the customer satisfied and yet doesn't make us deploy PCAN uh, on customer sites. We call this solution uh, remote modeling, 
And what we did is uh, to make it possible to run data related jobs on the customer side so that their data won't leave uh, their site, their infrastructure uh, at all. Uh, the solution requires the customer to open a Databricks uh, account, which takes a, a couple of clicks and uh, connect uh, the account to the cloud service account. And Databricks supports, supports uh, AWS, Azure, and uh, Google Cloud. Uh, so we needed to implement our data processing job uh, execution only once using Databricks API, and they already take care of how it's going to run on the customer's cloud uh, account. So the solution looks like this. Um, we have Airflow uh, that knows how to execute data-related jobs on picking data, data bricks or a, a customer data bricks. And the only thing we need from the customer is a token which uh, allows us to execute uh, jobs on their Databricks account. And this architecture saves us so much effort. And I guess each one of you that maintains on-prem solutions uh, will appreciate uh, how creative it is. We got to our last tip for today, uh, monitor your model in production. And please look at the perfect GIF I found. As we all know, the process doesn't stop when we have a deployed model in production. In some ways, it's just the beginning. Um, Model monitoring refers to the process of uh, tracking the performance of a machine learning model in production. It uh, enables us to ident identify and eliminate issues, including bad quality predictions and poor technical performance. Uh, Monitoring models effectively is very important for making our machine learning service uh, successful. It uh, enables us to create a major impact in the real world. And this is not an easy thing to do. It requires us to close the circle between the predictions we have given and the reality. And at PCAN, we've created a dedicated monitoring pipeline for each of our predictions. We calculate the actual label uh, when the time comes, and then we can compare between it to the predicted value that we gave uh, and actually evaluate uh, our model over time. For example, let's look at uh, this binary classification a dashboard. Uh, this is an ongoing updated uh, dashboard that uh, represents our status over a, a time period. This is an example for a churn model a monitoring dashboard. The light blue area represents the false positives. The blue area represents the true positives. Uh, the red area represents the false negatives, and the gray area represents the true negatives. The empty area under the dashed line represent predictions which we still didn't evaluate since it's not the time yet to calculate the label, at least according to the time uh, I took this screenshot. Uh, and the area under the dashed line will be filled in the future. The dashed line represents the predictions, uh, what our model predict, and the area under the dashed line will be filled in the future after we will calculate uh, what will happen in the future. So from looking at the dashboard, you can get a good indication of how your model works over time. And Let's look at the same dashboard, but for a regression task. Um, and we can see here the actual results compared to the predicted results over time. 
very similar to the previous one. So if you're still here listening to me, thank you so much for your time. I hope you learn something new that can help you uh, in your journey uh, of building your generic and scalable pipeline. Um, I feel very lucky to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about our journey to build our pipeline uh, from scratch. And please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or you just want to chat. I would love to connect with you. Um, thank you again. Thank you.